Hi guys, welcome to Tea Time with Ruth Mir. Um, today, as you probably know, we are going to go ahead and do a tour of the third floor of Ruth Mir. Um, now, if at any time you guys have any questions, please do feel free to um, put them in the comments below. They do pop up, so I will be able to um, see those as we go. So, um, before we get started here, um, I just want to direct your attention up to um, this beautiful stained glass window. Now keep this in mind. We are on the second floor landing um, of Roosmere. And this stained glass window up here leads up to the third floor. Now I'm going to direct you to show you exactly how you get up there. Now going in this way towards the staff quarters. We are going to head up the stairs to the third floor. And notice it's very bright up here. <laughs> and we have Joy! Hi, Joy! Such an odd place to have tea, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's so kind of cool we get this opportunity to do this, though. Mm -hmm. So, for yours. Sure. Um, it's a little hot. There's that if you need it. One thing I want to know um, would be what our viewers are having for their tea time today. I know that you have strawberry pomegranate and I have chosen the constant comment. Tea. And I like that you chose something pomegranate because that goes right along with the house. Of course, it's one of my favorites. And uh, yeah, so please let us know in the comments what kind of tea you will be drinking. Um, now, you'll notice this is just the first area of the third floor. Um, there's actually a lot to talk about here. You might be surprised. So Joy, why don't you tell us a little bit about why we're doing this today? Well, I heard that you were focusing on the skylight downstairs, and this is something of interest to a lot of our guests is this is a box that was created to protect that jewel. This box allows the sunlight, like today, to come in. And then at some point, it was also illuminated with the light bulbs all the way around it. It gets a little tricky when I need to open this up to check in on the condition of it and things like that. So it takes almost the full staff to open up this protected type of lid for it. And we check for condition if there's been any movement of the glass or whatever. So uh, we do really want to watch this. So this big lid right now was added, oh, probably 1920s or so, I can tell by the glass. And we keep a um, piece of plastic over it to make sure that um, it is extra, extra safe up here. Awesome, and then, I don't know if you said, how often do you actually go in here and do that maintenance? At least once a year, a couple times a year, we just kind of decide on different seasons with when we can get this Definitely during our closed period when I do everything, uh, deep cleaning and things like that. And so um, this is something that we'll be doing before we open up. So. Awesome. All right. So um, this chute back here, I know we wanted to talk about this a little bit. Can you tell us about what this is for? It stands very silent, but it was very important during the early part of this house. Down in the game room on the lowest level would be a flue that the uh, maid service would open up. And then they would open this up and it was designed to draw the hot air all the way up and it would cool down the home. I was told that in these early type of uh, cooling things like this that they could put wet towels on there to add moisture to the air. Or if you even want to scent the house that you could put bowls of rose petals in there too. But this was something that was very important to the early houses. The way they designed these houses is amazing. In this area, you think just as a uh, storage space, you'll see that there is a picture rail all the way around that shows importance of this area. Either Elizabeth, the homeowner, had things that she wanted to decorate up here with, or it was a place to store uh, the other paintings while maybe she wanted to change some out. So there's just little features in areas that you can kind of take note as you go by and it has crown molding too. I mean, who does that in a space like this? So mm -hmm. all of this over here, up here was still part of the Beardsley's living space. And so it was very decorative. Fantastic. Um, can you tell us what exactly is over here or what used to be on the wall and then what this is in the center? We had a couple of portraits of Andrew Hubble Beardsley and his wife, um, Helen Maud Beardsley. Um, and then 
on this beautiful Victorian table is a castle, a handmade castle that was once owned and played with by Walter Beardsley, and it was passed to his son Robert. And so we cherish that piece, and I like bringing that out for <laughs> our Christmas decor. So it's really kind of a fun piece. All right. Now over here, you'll notice we have uh, staff only. Um, this is a room where we keep all of our archives. You will notice <laughs> it's very securely locked. Um, unfortunately, we will not be touring that room today because most of it is private. Um, but we will head over this way now to the first bigger room on the third floor. And we do call this the green room. And you'll notice um, there is a reason we call it the green room. It's because of the wallpaper. <laughs> That's true. So um, can you tell us what this room would have been used for? I knew this room when I first started years ago as the China room. There was a beautiful collection of presidential China that was displayed in this room. Um, not originally. What this room was probably created for, I was told, again, in theory, was maybe for Elizabeth, the homeowner's off-season clothes. If she did have costuming or things that she wore, because we heard and have uh, printed material that she would dress in costume to do teas and different things for her gal pals, this might have been a room that she did store some of her um, clothing in. And then it was later by, for one of the families that lived up here, was used as a bedroom. And then when it was going to be part of the tour and had the china displayed up here, this beautiful Morris green wallpaper was applied to the walls. And uh, now we call it the green room because it <laughs> is very green. And, but this is a Morris style. Uh, William Morris style wallpaper on uh, wall covering on this and again you see the uh, crown molding and you also see the plate rail so this was a, an important room at some point so we use this as archives a wonderful place to keep archives safe and um, different artifacts and things like that if I'm trading things out that has a safe place to come up here and be stored so um, I know there's a few artifacts you wanted to kind of use to plug our exhibit for <laughs> next year. Well, um, the more <laughs> I get closer to it for next year, the more excited that we are getting. We do have some pieces that are coming out of the collection up here. The Wedgwood, we do have a green jasper plate over there. And on the far wall over there, we have some of the indigo blue that also will be coming out in our collection. So up here, we do have pieces that... Um, are stored but we do use in different times and so I do want to plug that little um, exhibit <laughs> that's coming next year and so be watching for our Wedgwood it is really going to be a wonderful time I'm, I'm looking excited. forward to it yeah mm -hmm. me too <laughs> okay so um, unless there's anything else you wanted to cover in this room oh there's a lot but we'll just go keep going okay <laughs> so um, we will head to Unfortunately, it is the last room, but it's also the biggest room, and it has the most to talk about. Now, this is a wonderfully large, decorative, beautiful room we have on the third floor, which is called the Baldwin Room. And can you tell us why we call it that? Well, it's because most of the furniture that was stored up here belonged to the Baldwin family. Elizabeth Beardsley was a Baldwin. And um, so she was from Elkhart. She ended up being the only living sibling in that family. And so pieces that belonged to her family were given to her. And so she created this beautiful room up here for that. We are often asked, is there a ballroom in the mansion? And you can see that this room is not a bald one. It's a bald one room, but it's not a ballroom. So um, it was created with her favorite color, with this rose pink. The draperies <laughs> that are um, hanging, we have part of the original draperies. We do have all of them, but they're in pretty bad shape in storage. But that rose uh, pink that she loved, and so those are still up here. But you can just tell that this room was a room that she found very important. Number one, we have a photo of this room, so that shows the importance of that. Number two, it's highly decorated, and so she wanted a safe place for her family's heirlooms. And we still do have some of those up here so that's really a wonderful thing so we'll talk about those as we get closer to those all right and I just want to show you guys as we have with many rooms in the house we have old photographs that the Beardsleys took to actually show what the room looked like when they lived here 
Now, hopefully I can get it in focus there. There we go. So you can kind of see, um, it does look remarkably similar. And you can see a few of the furniture pieces that we actually still have up here, which we will talk about once we get to them. But um, you'll see this old uh, black and white photograph. It was indeed a decorated space. It was not just for storage. With that, we will head on over here and we will start um, kind of make our way around the room and talk about some of the really cool artifacts we have in the cases and on the walls. Um, now let's talk about what's in here. What are some of these artifacts? These pieces belong to Walter. Um, the Beardsleys through each generation were very involved in politics and they served on uh, the Republican Party in some form, um, like AR and Hub were senators for Indiana and Walter was very involved. And so we have uh, some of his artifacts from the time that he was serving. Um, so those are in here. If you want to talk about any of those over there, I like Ike. I really think that's <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> and some like Dewey, some people that just didn't make it too far. But, yeah. Um, well, one of my favorite artifacts in here, um, regardless of your political leanings, is cool to see this history. Um, we have this pewter box and card. This was presented to Walter Beardsley. Um, he was one of the gentlemen that helped restore Ruth Mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was given to him by uh, Richard Nixon. So you can actually see a card here that says, with sincere appreciation for your support of my 1968 presidential campaign, uh, Dick Nixon, signed by himself. So very, very cool that we have that. And I know he has a whole lot of other um, presidential memorabilia that we actually don't even have in here anymore. It's in other storage. Right, but. that's very true. And the case itself that it is protected in um, is a beautiful old jewelry mm -hmm. uh, case. And so uh, we're very fortunate to have these pieces here that um, keep these artifacts very safe. Mm -hmm. Now over here on the wall, you might have seen this if you've been following our social media for a while. Um, this is a portrait of Elizabeth Beardsley. It's actually called a collotype, which is a very old form of photography. Um, pick one of the pretty much the earliest picture we have of Elizabeth, I believe. Um, it would have been probably around the 1850s. She doesn't look like she's more than 10 years old and she was born in 1850. So um, that is a really cool old photo that we do have of her. And it's amazing how much she looks like in all of her pictures. I know, that's very true. Very sweet, <clears throat> you know, big eyes. It's just a, a very sweet portrait of her. Definitely. So, the original glass, the wavy glass. Yeah. So what can you tell us about this gentleman here? This is Charlie. <laughs> this is Charles <laughs> Ridsley. He also served. He was very important to the Miles Laboratories too. Um, and so this was a one that uh, was painted of him in his older years, but very wonderful portrait. And um, if you want to read a little bit of what he, um, what it says on, on the sure. shingle there for his picture. Yeah, so he was the president of Miles Lab from 1944 to 47, um, chairman from 47 to 68. Um, also a nephew of uh, A.R. Beardsley, Charles was a law school graduate of University of Michigan. Um, he was known as a man with a flair for promotion. Um, <laughs> Charles' advertising vision helped build Alka-Seltzer Alka sales to a successful level. By 1958, Miles Laboratories was listed as one of the 500 largest U.S. corporations in the Fortune 500 list. And in 1962, the company opened a $4 million Charles S. Beardsley Research Laboratory. Named after him. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is just one of the nephews of AR, like the sign said. Mm -hmm. and they were very involved with their nieces and nephews. That's where we get Andrew Hubble, Arthur, who owned the house after AR, um, Charles, um, just a lot of people that came out of that family. Uh, Solomon Beardsley was mm -hmm. AR's brother, had all of these kids. And so um, we do, you know, whenever I see Charles or um, AR, uh, you know, I know that he was involved in their lives um, very well. And they followed him in his business. Yeah. Wonderful. I love the piece underneath this portrait mm -hmm. too. This is something very to important to, to, to mention. All um, it has been reupholstered, but this again was one of the Baldwin pieces that was original to this room. And it is in a uh, highly carved walnut, very Victorian. It would have been owned by the Silas Baldwin family. And so it's wonderful that it is up here. So, and I've used this in different uh, displays. Um, it's very heavy and we don't, take it out of here very often, but it is original to this house. And you'll notice if anyone does come up here, 
it is roped off as a sign to say, don't put your butt on this. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm actually going to close this okay. for a second, if that's okay. Um, so over here, we have perhaps one of our sadder pieces that we have in the Ruth Muir collection. Um, it's getting a glare. This is a very dark portrait, so it's a little hard to see. Um, but this is Frank Baldwin. Frank Baldwin was um, one of Elizabeth Beardsley's brothers. He um, actually died uh, in the Civil War as a young teenager. He was only about 16 years old when he died. Um, but he is the soldier. If you remember from last week, if you watched um, the Elkhart trivia, he is the soldier who the um, Memorial and Rice Cemetery is dedicated to um, or is featured on. Um, he, it used to be in downtown on Main Street, but it was moved to Rice Cemetery. Um, his father, Silas, actually commissioned um, that memorial to be built um, after he passed away in um, memorial of not just him, but all of the soldiers in the area who fell during the Civil War. So it's very cool that we have that portrait. And, and I should also mention it was painted um, by Lucille Cook. And I'll let Joy tell you a little bit about her. Very important artist. Lucille painted several portraits when Elizabeth found her. One is of baby Ruth that is downstairs in uh, the morning room. Mm -hmm. And also she had her do a portrait of her mother, Jane Baldwin. Uh, Lucille Cook is important to mention for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of women artists just did not get the commission jobs. Uh, it seemed like the men always got those jobs. And another reason that's important to mention her is that she was a Hoosier artist. And so um, it's just kind of, I'm not sure how Elizabeth found her, but when she did, she did commission her to do some very important portraits. And so this is of her mother. Now, her father, Silas, um, we already had this one uh, painted, and so it's a nice match. You would not have guessed that Lucille did not do this one. But um, McNeil, I believe, was a the artist Ambrose McNeil. Mm -hmm. yep. of this one, uh, an Irish artist. <clears throat> and so, um, but Silas Baldwin was a very important businessman in early Elkhart. He had his hands in a lot of wonderful business endeavors and really kind of helped put uh, Elkhart on the map. So um, Elizabeth came from a good family. So Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and did you want to talk a little bit about the, the windows? Did, you didn't do that already, right? <laughs> I didn't. The, the port <laughs> windows that we do have here, which we um, do have UV filmed also, um, it, they're double hung and they were made to open up to bring in the air. And uh, we never open them now, but the, I call them porthole uh, windows. So when you pass the mansion and you look up, you see these beautiful windows and they are all mitered and doubly uh, hung and everything else. But just the way that you know that they would have opened up to bring the cool breeze all the way up here and get the hot air out. It's kind of, in, it's kind of intriguing to me. Let's talk about the walls themselves. These walls look like they're covered with encrusted wallpaper, but this technique was when the uh, plaster was wet, an artist would put a plate into it and be able to know when to pull it back out. And it would leave this wonderful impression on the wall. So a lot of people think it's Lincrusta wallpaper. It is not wallpaper, it is actually plaster. So again, highly decorated room, very important room for Elizabeth's legacy. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to be moving over to this case now. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the case itself before this, we talk about what's in it. This case reminds me of something that um, was probably purchased in the Grand Rapids collection. This is original to this house, and I was here when it was brought upstairs, and that was quite a feat. So, <laughs> <laughs> But we use it for some of the Miles memorabilia that we do have, and I'll trade things out of this every once in a while um, for different exhibits, um, but this is where we keep some, like the uh, pencil sharpener that actually sat on Miles' desk and things like that. So Doc Miles, is, uh, his things are in here. One thing that I love in this collection is the apothecary jar down here. Absolutely beautiful. Still, ha still has its finial uh, top on that, and we keep it very safe in this very heavy cabinetry. So it's just really wonderful. That is beautiful. And um, what can you tell us about this piece up here? No, oh, I'd love to talk about this piece. This is very <laughs> Victorian, and this was Elizabeth. Um, it really shows off what was important to them at that time. This is created out of feathers and actual petals 
and actual dried flowers called a bell jar and this is something that is very beautiful and it was here originally so it's important to me <laughs> it's beautiful okay we'll head on this way over here um what can you tell us about the vitrine here and what's inside yes it's french again kind of tucked away up here very highly decorated and it holds the um, porcelain in there very french porcelain pieces in there so it's just a treasure sitting up here <laughs> now you'll notice we have a music box here there was also one in the other corner of the room i want you to put a pin on that and um, we'll talk about that towards the end and you'll see why <laughs> so next we will talk about um the three portraits we have over here hanging on the wall and uh, who they were, who painted them, all that good stuff. Do you want me to say that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, Crandall um, was the, the artist, yes. um, Bradshaw Crandall. A lot of times when the gentleman, the Beardsley gentleman sat at the helm of Miles, you were had your portrait commissioned by a New York artist and a wonderful artist. And then um, we do have one of one of the wives we do have marjorie buchanan beardsley here and that beautiful sapphire blue lace dress is still here in storage and it's absolutely gorgeous beautiful uh, portrait of her and then her husband hangs on the other side that's walter and walter along with his son robert had that idea of bringing this house to the public and and having the restoration done so we owe a lot to uh the time of Walter and Robert still um, will enjoy it and uh, has a lot of, uh, whenever I have a question, I can ask Robert because he knows the answer to this. <laughs> right here in this middle is Ed. Um, this is a beautiful portrait of Ed. And he would have been the son of the second family, Arthur and Stella. And um, Ed had some children. Um, one of them would be Lemon or Lem, people that worked at Miles, remember working for Lem. And then Lem had a son by the name of Ed, um, and named after his father. So our director right now, Ed Beardsley, is, would be the grandson of this gentleman right here. So it's just wonderful that we do have that connection. And so if Ed's watching, hello. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we do have this sitting over or underneath um, Ed's portrait here is this beautiful 1877 parlor Steinway. I was not around when this came upstairs. I have no <laughs> idea, but I do know that it is not going to move. So it's going to stay <laughs> up here. Um, beautiful the piece. Time. And it's really kind of interesting to know that the Steinway company goes back that far mm -hmm. and would have such a beautiful ornate um, instrument. And they were smaller in size because they would fit into the parlors and still uh, be a very focal point for the parlors, but it absolutely is gorgeous. And I'm so thankful that this is in part of our collection too. Absolutely. Now, this is a chair I almost tripped on just now. Um, <laughs> and a very, very interesting chair. Is there a name for this kind of chair? Uh, we call it a conversation chair. The mm -hmm. French would call it tit -a tat That means sit and chat. And um, <laughs> this was something that was also shown in the original photo uh, mm -hmm. that was once owned by the, the Baldwin family. So it's very, very rare yeah i was gonna they say usually i've don't make it never far. seen any <laughs> that look like this before and the ribbon says please do not sit on it exactly but, um, <laughs> it is it does take center stage in this room so it's mm -hmm. really wonderful that we still have this here very cool all right so we're gonna head over here um i believe this is our last portrait that we will touch on mr compton he was the one of the original uh had the idea of the uh miles medical group it would be Miles A.R. and Mr. Compton. And so he was a very important uh, gentleman in early Elkhart. So I know that some people that know Elkhart history will ask every once in a while, well, where did Mr. Compton come in? And so he was part of the original Miles um, Medical Company, so. Awesome. All right, so we will move into what is in these cases here. And I think this is one of the coolest things that we have in our collection. Um, that I wish more people got to see. Um, this is our presidential China collection. And uh, we have the China of four different presidents. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson, um, Abraham Lincoln, 
Benjamin Harrison, and then over here we have some that belong to Rutherford B. Hayes. Now I'll let you uh, talk a little bit about them. Too, down there Garfield, or something. Yeah, oh, or he's mentioned in some of it, but. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that when President, I'm going to read this, President uh, Benjamin Harrison moved into the White House in 1889, a portion of the furniture fund, and the furniture fund was the fund that would purchase the things like China for the, for the White House, it was used um, to, get a, to buy a new set of China, and Mrs. Harrison was an accomplice, his wife, um, Caroline. Harrison was a, a quite an accomplished artist and so she would organize classes in hand painting China in the White House for the wives of the cabinet members and she followed her husband's platform of uh, Indiana or of America first in the design. Um, one of the things that I want to point out for them would be this plate right here. It has the seal, the eagle on the front on the top and then there's um, 44 flags that go all over, or stars that go around to represent the states that were in the union at that time and then also what do you see on the edge Dree? Mm -hmm. Corn! corn. <laughs> <laughs> there's more than corn in Indiana they were from Indiana so they put that motif of corn on the presidential china I had to chuckle about that but this is a very important set, uh, piece of that set too um, and I love the royal purple on this one this is a reproduction of the one that um, that was created during Abraham Lincoln's time a little bit more simple but that was what the presidents could do um, some of the presidents would decide to um, just keep the china and maybe add to it and so I know that some of the older sets would only have 30 place settings whereas now uh, the china has over 100 place settings because of the big state dinners and things like that so I was told too and if you'll come down here and look at these Limoges pieces that if you were a guest at the White House and you sat down for dinner and lo and behold in front of you was a bowl that had a turtle on it you were going to be served turtle soup here's one with a crab probably crab bisque they had a plate to serve whatever you were eating and so that's why the presidential china is so vast if you ever make it into the white house you'll see uh, cabinets that were created to house the old um, historic china on into everyday use and so the beautiful pieces that we have here are actuals these are absolutely beautiful and sometimes um, through the years people had a little bit of a conflict about having these made outside of the united states but these are haviland uh, limoges beautiful pieces hand painted and they uh, talked about the the fauna um, the flora and fauna of the american states and so that's what's featured on the presidential china and this all these um animal related ones all belong to uh rutherford B. right Hayes. he only had these for about a year and then he was out of <clears> office <throat> oh. so this one's turned over to show the signature of one of the very important artists and that's theodore davis and he did uh the paintings of these and so this is a big deal that we do have uh some that that mr davis had he painted himself and it was quite a process that they would have to uh, he would make the um, sketches and the paintings they would roll them send them to, to Paris to Limoges um, they would be hand decorated send them back for him to do some I mean it was just quite a process and so I'm very I feel that we are very fortunate to own uh, just a small part of presidential China definitely and we actually also have these really cool labels up here that kind of show um, what some of the other presidents through China the years. looks like mm -hmm. through the years that we don't have them in our collection but it's still very cool to see how they each made their own very unique I think t Teddy Roosevelt's might be the simplest one up there that one in the middle on the right <laughs> that's true it's very elegant <laughs> it's elegant yes, yes. yes. it's very mm -hmm. simple mm -hmm. although FDR's looks remarkably similar to his too it's interesting so yeah, the reason um, I would say we probably have all of these is because of the um, Beardsley family's involvement with politics. Um, our little sign here reads that um, AR enjoyed great success in the political arena and was eventually hailed as one of the best known Republicans in Northern Indiana. So um, as such, it seems very appropriate that we have these 
um, politically related objects as well as our Washington portrait downstairs, um, the Salmon Chase um, China that we also have downstairs and other things like that. And so. you can visit this home, you know, yes. not only was he a great man and very important to Miles, but he was very important in the political circle for Indiana. Mm -hmm. So this is really wonderful. You can't visit us now, but you will soon. <laughs> So be watching for our opening day. Fingers crossed for June 14th. Hopefully that doesn't change. That's true. And you will get a fl an American flag when you come that day. Yes. So. It'll be flag day. <laughs> so the last thing we're going to show off here before we take questions, um, I'll let you go through there. So we mentioned the music box, um, and this is kind of a special treat. Um, we actually were very delighted to find that this music box still works. Um, and so we're going to turn it on for you after she explains a little bit of what it's called and one thing that was very important to this household, Elizabeth loved music, and even though this was not owned by them, this is a Regina uh, music box, and this would have been what they would have had. And we were very fortunate to have this as a donation to us by Father Menix, and so we do play this every once in a while, but mo for the most of the part, it just sits up here silent. So it's wonderful that we can turn this on today, and you can hear the eerie sounds of music the way that it was. <laughs> Are you ready? It's very eerie. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a haunted carnival. It's not even electric. You know, when they were doing the, that creepiest museum objects thing, this probably would have been This would have worked. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> What scared me that time is when that other one started all by itself, and so that was kind of fun that all of a sudden <laughs> the mechanism started up. So yeah, really yeah. Beautiful. But it's very, very haunting in the way it I'm sounds. I'm leave it running. <laughs> okay, so we are going to head back out. And now... <laughs> Hi, Bill! <laughs> And now um, we will take um, any questions that anybody has. Um, although I'm not seeing if anybody is watching or if any comments have already been made, so I'm not sure. We're not live? What do you 